Dave Palumbo. And uh, joining me today is going to be uh, guru and prep coach Matt Jensen. Uh, welcome to the show. What's up, Dave? Thank you so much for having me on. It's, a, it's an honor to be a part of this, and uh, I'm excited to do it. Thank you. You know, you're, you're a popular guy out there in terms of coaching. A lot of top guys use you. I know you probably have a lot of mid-level guys as well that, you know, don't get the, the, the acknowledgement. But, I mean, that's usually as a coach, that's what makes up the base of our, uh, of our constituency, so to speak. You know, I want to talk, Matt, today about um, a specific portion of contest prep, and that's the last four weeks. Because I always say the last four weeks is like I call it hell week or, or hell time because it's – that's where you really separate the men from the boys, the girls from the women, because it's tough. It doesn't matter yeah. what kind of a diet you follow, whether you eat carbs, you don't eat carbs. The last four weeks, when you have that little last bit of fat to lose, is always the toughest because your body just doesn't want to get rid of that weight. Um, I want to know some of the strategies that you employ and, and, and some of the things that change in your contest prep. We can talk about men predominantly just to start so that... We have a, you know, we can go back and forth, but let's let's assume you you got a top level male bodybuilder. Um, what in your, in your, I guess you could say, coaching experience changes, and how do you help people to get from that last four weeks up to the day to show? Okay, so I think the first thing, and, and this kind of is a broader statement that can go into every variable, but I want to try to create as clear of a picture as possible of, of where that athlete's at within their prep. So. Um, really kind of fine tuning the diet, making sure that your digestion's on point, making sure that we eliminate any foods that are causing any issues or gas or bloating, anything like that. Um, I also touch base with them and this is when I really start to kind of fine tune things like uh, their water intake on a daily basis, sodium intake on a daily basis. Uh, because like I said, like, as you're going through this part of the prep, I think if you can minimize the, the mental toll of um, questioning things, uh, the mental side of it's really big to me. So if we can kind of have a plan in place that rules out as many outliers as possible and just creates a clear picture of exactly what's going on from a water balance to a digestion standpoint to a mineral standpoint, I think it's really going to help the athlete and not only the athlete, but also myself see exactly where they're at. Um, what exactly is water? What exactly is body fat? How much further we still have to go? And, you know, and then just kind of manipulate the variables in there. Um, obviously, another thing, too, is, is drugs play a huge role in this. Right. Um, you want to make sure that you're controlling estrogen balance properly. You want to make sure and, and esters can, can kind of play a role. Um, I think it's more important that you're controlling the estrogen balance. I personally prefer to go with uh, shorter esters because, again, it, it creates that clear picture. Um, and one thing that I don't like doing with my guys is saying, OK, well, we we still have X, Y, and Z in the mix. When we pull X, Y, and Z, this should happen. Um, really, you know, at that point of the prep, those X, Ys, and G, Zs should be giving you a very clear picture of where you're at and how much progress you still have to make before you step on stage. You know, it's interesting, but, you know, it, it seems like the last four weeks, a lot of things change, at least in, in I know how I view things, because obviously estrogen management is very important, as you mentioned earlier, in the, in the entire prep process. But you don't want to lower estrogen too much either, you know, in the early parts of the prep because, you know, you get flat, your joints hurt, uh, you know, things, you know, you need estrogen to sensitize your androgen receptors. So, sure. but that kind of changes the last four weeks. The last four weeks is kind of like, we're not really worried about building or retaining. We're trying to, we're trying to get rid of every last bit of fat and dry the person right. out as much as possible. So I know a lot of people, I don't know if you do, I was going to ask you, do you up your anti-estrogens a lot the last four weeks? Yeah, and I, again, like I honestly, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of anti-estrogens throughout the whole prep, um, but I do get more aggressive with them at the end, and then I might change. Um, it's, you know, some people I use aromasin to start, and then I might use aromasin to Remadex for basically, uh, you know, the basically the whole duration of the prep, and yeah. then if I feel like that we could still push that variable even farther, I might switch from the aromasin to Remadex to Letrozole at the end. Um, but Dave, you're right, like. Uh, when you start to get to that point, it's, it's just about kind of really saving yourself in the gym. Obviously, your leverages are going to be off. Um, you know, your support against even a belt is going to be off. Um, you know, so it's just really about like minimizing risk in the gym, possibly even changing movements in the gym because of the fact that your water balance is lower, because of the fact that your leverages is off. So if you're somebody that squatted the whole prep, I'm not going to say no, don't squat. But at the right. same time, there's definitely more risk associated there. So if you could go to something like a, you know, a hack squat and, and replicate that same movement pattern that way, I think it's going to go a long way because at this point you have to think to yourself, it's not so much about 
what you're doing in the gym as much as it is about representing the best look on stage and, and how to get there within being as lean and tight and dry as possible. Yeah. I think also you have to be careful too though because I, I remember one prep I was doing, I was I tried to take the same approach. I'm like, you know what? Do I really need the free weight squat? You know, so I said, why don't I just do Smith machine squats? It's because I'm feeling a little weak. I don't, you know, I'm not as strong. And you know what? I wound up hurting myself because I never really did Smith machine squats and I kind of locked myself into a position that was unnatural and I was strong still and I wound up pulling a quad and luckily I didn't yeah. tear it, you know, severely. So you, you have to be careful too. Sometimes it's better just to kind of lighten the weight a little bit, you know, of what you are sure. doing because if you start throwing sure, new yeah. stuff in, sometimes that can be dangerous as well. Absolutely, yes. Now, um, when I view, I guess, anti-estrogens, back when I competed, you know, in the early part of the, my career, they didn't really have any aromatase inhibitors. They had Nulvidex, which was, you know, Tamoxin, which is an estrogen receptor blocker, which is pretty much what everyone used. We used Proviron because we thought it was an anti-estrogen because Bill Phillips told us it was in his book, but it really wasn't. And, uh, you know, it, I remember I had access at one point to something called Teslac. I don't even know if you know what that is. It's Teslalactone. Yeah, it. It's actually an anabol. It's actually considered a steroidal compound that actually is an aromatase inhibitor. But it was like super expensive. You had to take like 20 pills a day. It was a pain in the ass. Um, but then they came out with Arimidex and then, then that followed with Femara and uh, Letras, I mean, and Aromacin. On paper, and at least in the research studies that I've read most recently, they say that all the aromatase inhibitors are pretty much equivalent to each other. However, I do have noted, I usually use Arimidex on people just because by convention I've always used it, but I do notice sometimes people don't respond to it and they need to resp and they respond better to letrozole. I don't know if it's because there's fake stuff out there or if there's really some people that don't respond to one aromatase inhibitor or another. What's your experience with that? Yeah, I mean, I'm right there with you. You know, from a, from a health perspective, I would always choose aromacin. Um, but then again, I don't always think that aromacin provides the best look. So that's when I'll start to kind of keep aromacin in. Um, you know, but when you say aromacin, that's exomethane. You're not talking about arimidex, yes. which is uh, yeah, uh, correct. Correct. Okay. Exomethane. Yeah. So that's that's typically my go-to, especially in the off season. But um, I, I've noticed the same thing, even with guys that have prescriptions of both. Yeah. Um, with the the exomethane. Uh, when we switch from exomethane to arimidex, they get a tighter, drier look pretty much immediately. So uh, that usually, unless there's no signs of, of them being off or everything's going to plan, then, then I'll put them on arimidex. And then again, for that kind of final kick, um, I've, I've seen very, very positive things happen. Again, I'm talking here prescription drugs going yeah. from arimidex to letrozole. Uh, and with the, the, the letrozole, I don't put that in for a long period of time because that's when I really see a tank in strength, I see a tank in energy levels. Um, but you know, usually that final week, and I might start it like every other day, and then the last four or five days go every day. Um, but I've seen incredible things happen with that in a very short amount of time when used, you know, towards the end of a prep. You know, when they do the studies on these um, these aromatase inhibitors, they're, they're testing them on women with breast cancer. You know what I mean? To, to lower, you know the small amount of aromatization that goes on in their body. So I don't think it's really applicable to bodybuilders, but it's interesting that bodybuilders don't respond equivalently to these things, which tells me that these drugs may be inhibiting something else that we're really not sure of, and that we're not, you know, or that maybe some of these anabolics convert to different, I don't know, kinds of estrogen, or I, I don't know, use different aromatase isomers. I, I think that we haven't figured out the whole story yet, and that we're gonna find out more, because really they should all work the same if they inhibit the same enzyme, but they don't. And that, that, right. that's yeah. what I find interesting. You know? And you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, it, the, the, one of the biggest struggles that I find on a daily basis when, within coaching is the legitimacy of, of what the athletes are using, you know, yeah. and that's always yeah. a question that I have to kind of go into, you know, when I'm looking through trying to problem solve is, well, you know, I, I often just, I'm, I'm, I'm real and transparent. I ask them, I say, you know, is this underground or, you know, where do you get this from? And, and then we go from there. I, I hate to say it. Sometimes I have to tell people. I'm like, you know what? I, I, I in all honesty, I, you look natural to me, you know. And it's a horrible thing to say to a competitor, but I'm usually right. You know, I can tell what a natural athlete looks like. And um, luckily, you know, we have these uh, these Roy test kits that Bill Llewellyn makes. And I know I sell them on my website, and um, we sell a ton of them. But the smart people test their drugs and see if they're real. You can even right. test your GH now. And, I, and there's a clenbuterol test coming out. So there's no excuse for not. For using fake gear anymore so it's just a matter of being lazy or maybe not wanting to spend the 20 bucks in the test kit but 
this is your people put so much time and effort and so much money into their contest prep, and then they 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 won't even test to see if the drugs they're using are, are real. Yeah, you know? no, and then and then especially with men, there's such a pride factor when I you know. bring up that question of, hey man, I don't think what you're using is real. It's like all of a sudden you just told them their mom is a terrible person or yeah, something. Yeah, you know? yeah. Anyway, but yeah, anyway, so those Roy tests are available at DavePalumbo.com. So if you guys uh, just just trust me, test your stuff. You'd be shocked at how many people tell me this stuff. GH, probably 50% is fake, I'd say. Um, I'd probably say 95% of Prima Bowl is fake. And a, a lot of Anavar is fake, believe it or not. And I yeah, know a lot Anavar of women using it. So I, I make sure all the women I work with always test Anavar because there's, a lot of times it's, it's, it's not nothing. It's usually Diana Bowl is what it usually right. is. So. That's not good for, for a bikini competitor to be taking Diana yeah. ball for sure. Now, what if you're if you're working with someone that lasts four weeks and they and you feel that they're behind? What putting aside the drugs for a minute, okay? What will you do to their diet? What what usually what will radically change in some of the guys or women's plans that you work with that last four weeks when you say, uh oh, you know what? I think we're a little behind. We got the Arnold Classic in four weeks. We got to really turn the screw. Well, let me let me give you a story. This is uh, this story just happened last year at the Olympia. So I got to, and, and I can give a more you know more in depth on, on the general question. Yeah. But I got to the Olympia on Sunday, so this was six days out of the show, um, and uh, I saw Sean Clarita that night in person right. at the gym, and and he had just traveled. So uh, in my opinion, his look was a little off, but I wanted to see for sure in the morning. So now we're we're talking about Monday morning. He wakes up. And uh, I went and saw him in person. And uh, again, the the mental aspect of coaching is a, is a huge, important part. And I think that's something that we need to take a lot of personal responsibility in as coaches. So I saw him in the morning. Um, I, I looked him over and I, I wanted to kind of just analyze the situation on my own apart from him. Um, so I said, hey, I'm going to go. I'm going to go back to my hotel. I'm going to look over your plan. I'm going to send you your plan. So I actually got back in the car from his hotel and I was literally just like so upset with myself because I felt like we had a huge opportunity and I just felt like he wasn't there. Um, and, and it 100% would have been my fault because of the fact that I know that Sean's somebody that does everything that I ask tenfold. Um, he lives this life to the fullest and, and I knew that it was on me, you know. So I got in my car and I said, okay, the first thing I need to do in this situation is I need to not overly mess him up mentally. Um, you know, so the way that I communicate with him needs to be very good. Um, and I also don't need to drastically 180, you know, shift his plan in six days time, because if, if I'm telling him that everything's OK, but yet at the same time, I pretty much 180 his plan. He's going to know something's wrong. So I looked at all the variables. I looked at how much cardio that he was doing. And I actually I stuck with my gut intuition during that final week, um, which is to kind of ease off the cardio. Right. But I didn't pull it back completely. Um, he was doing two sessions a day. I basically kept his one session in at 40 minutes in the morning. Um, and then I actually, I raised his food just slightly. I think I raised it about 35 grams of carbs mm. across the day. Now, Sean's somebody, he doesn't need to eat a tremendous amount of food. So 35 grams of carbs for Sean is like 185 for somebody else. Sure. But so we did that, but we, we literally, we pushed all week. You know, he, he did his cardio in the morning. We trained hard, um, not to the point of, again, risking something, you know, traumatic happening, but we trained very hard all week. He posed hard several times a day all week. Um, and just, you know, kind of day by day, this, this physique really started to kind of unfold. Um, but it wasn't a situation, and I want to say this too, for those of you guys that are listening, I think uh, the week of, the final week of the show, we just expect that everybody should be eating. Um, and, and guys, a lot of really positive things can happen in a short time frame. I'm talking 18 hours, you know, a carb load over 18 hours, like not everybody. And yes, there are those outliers, but not everybody needs to carb load for three days or four days. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's part of the reason why we're seeing physiques on stage that don't reflect what their progress pictures are leading up because they're yeah. just overly full, you yeah. know, and they've changed too many variables. So again, going back to Sean, um, it wasn't that I did like extreme measures, but like I made sure that we stayed on the gas. I didn't ease off the gas. Um, and, and again, the mental side of it, like because it was important to me that Sean and I were on the same page and that he still believed in the plan. Um, so that was and again, that was probably in terms of the whole outcome. Like that's a prep I'll never forget. Um, I'll never forget the final outcome on stage. Uh, but it came down to just like really looking at every variable, looking at where his digestion was. Um, and another thing, as far as digestion, going into that final week, 
if the guys aren't using it, I really like to put a magnesium supplement in place. Um, there's something called uh, Natural Calm. It's made by Natural Vitality. Mm. I love using that product. It's a it's a calm powder, uh, yeah. magnesium powder, and that really keeps digestion on track. Um, so just again, looking at all these variables and then making sure the guys are where they're at and need to be mentally is huge for me. Um, but in general, uh, you know, in that four weeks out span, if somebody's behind, more often than not, you just you got to push them. You know, you got to push the cardio, and then and I have conversations within the cardio as well. Like, okay, well, how hard are you truly working? Are you are you going in? Are you texting on your phone the whole time? Are you watching YouTube videos? Are you putting your head down and you going to work kind of thing? So, um, I do my best to try to communicate. Where, with where guys are at and and then I see like what gaps can we fill where can we push it more and, and it not not as it, it's not only about pushing it more but also t- times easing off but I would say in the greater scope of things when you're four weeks out and you're behind there's because there's there's untapped variables that you're not reaching yet you know it's not so much that you haven't been fed properly in most cases do you find that sometimes you I mean you work with a lot of high a high you know caliber athletes now they tend to sometimes bully you into not being hard enough on them initially in the early part of the contest prep because they think they're going to lose muscle and they think it's too much, you know, they're, 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 they're losing too much weight and they're, they're you, know, you know, you know what I'm talking about. They almost like talk you into giving them more than they really need. And then at some point you realize, fuck, I got to pull this, I got to, I got to crack the whip on this guy because, you know, I'm a little behind now. I would have been pushing him a little harder earlier, but you know, he, he gave me the whole song and dance, you know, I lose muscle and this and that. And you realize that that's really not the case. He's just, you know, being a mental case, so to speak. Yeah, no, I mean, you're right. And, and Dave, there's been mistakes. I mean, you know, like in 2016, I made that mistake with Dallas McCarver. Um, yeah. I, uh, we, we had a very, very close relationship and, and we lived together. And a part of that was I let the emotional part of our relationship play into the decision making process Mm -hmm. that I should have made with his X's and O's with his diet, you know, so that's definitely a role, Um, you know, and and you have to be as subjective as possible with these guys. And it's hard at times because you develop a friendship and Mm -hmm. you're communicating every day and then then they kind of confide in you as a friend. So now you're a friend and a coach, you know, and that friend emotion sometimes plays into your decision making process. I mean, it it definitely plays a role. but again, I, I, so within that, I sometimes notice that I coach people better if we, we aren't friends. Yeah, me too. I noticed that too. Yeah, me too. Um, and because I feel more emotionally for them when we are <laughs> friends, and then it, it does 100% impact my decision-making process. <laughs> no, it's true. I bring it up for a reason. because, but, And with well-known athletes too, they tend to want to be, you know, they try to influence the process rather than just say, I love the guys who just be like, tell me what to do, and I'm going to do it. Yeah. And, and they're machines, like the guy system is the world. But then there's other guys that like want, they want to give you their feedback, even though they hired you, knowing that they have very bad instincts for this. Right. But they right. still want to give you their their feedback constantly on what's going on. And I think that's good. I want people's feedback, but sometimes it does influence the decision making, and then you wind up fa- falling a little behind. Now, what do you do if you get an athlete four weeks out who's like ready? They're ready to get on stage. What do you do with those guys? I, if they're truly ready, then I just try to, to slowly increase their food as much as possible. Um, and I also look at their recovery because we have this mental block in our head that as we're going into the show, we got to do more, we got to do more, yeah. we got to do more, you know. And if, if they're ready, um, I'm a huge proponent of rest days, especially towards the Me end too. of a prep, yeah. um, at least twice a week, yep. uh, which is so hard because especially in today's social media era, <laughs> if these guys are resting, they're flipping through their phone, watching the other guys training, and they're like, man, I can get back in the gym, but but that necessarily might not be the best plan for them. Right. So um, ease off the gas, consider rest variables more, uh, you know, slowly start to bring the food back up. And again, I don't go from one extreme to the next because I think that's when you can really mess things up, but just, you know, maybe 60 grams of carbs at a time, mm-hmm. see how they respond to that, yep. and then go from there. Yeah, that's smart. I do that too. I'll do little days where I'll say, you know what, have an extra – have the last two meals add like you know forty grams or thirty grams of carbs to the both meals and with of white rice and they're like what and, and they actually yeah. you know look better a lot of times because sometimes you get run down you get overtrained and stuff like that but you're right people then tend to push I re- I tell people this story a lot but when I was a runner you know the running mentality is I think for five years I never took a day off I think I ran every single day even in snowstorms because that's just the mentality of the runner right you can't take days off because you're going to set yourself back so. I um when we would get ready for meets when I ran in college cross country, the coaches would taper us the last week before the show. In other words, we would run less leading up to the the comp- the, the, the the day of the meet because they wanted your body to recover. But I didn't understand this. So what I would do is they would 
instead of doing a 10 mile run, we might do like a four mile run. And he's like, go, go back, go have dinner, relax. I would go have dinner and then I'd go back out and run again, you know, because I thought, well, I'm going to get a, a jump on these guys. These guys are dogging it. I'm going to train harder because, but really what I was doing is just overtraining myself and I wasn't recovering and I didn't look, and I didn't run better. I ran worse probably because I wasn't rested. So I think it's the same thing with bodybuilders. They, they see, like you said, people, they see other guys in the gym training every single day, never taking a day off. And they think, well, I'll just go back. I'll do three sessions a day because I don't work yeah. a real job. I'll go to the gym. I'll do cardio in the morning. I'll, then I'll go do my weights and I'll come back and do a second session. I'll do, I'll come back again at, at night to do uh, the abs and, and hamstrings. And before you know it, they're completely overtrained, you know? Right. Yep. Yep. And the more yeah. they overtrain, obviously, the more their cortisol levels go up, which starts eating up muscle and making them whole water. Uh, you're right. If you, you know, sometimes I tell people, you know what? The next two days, nothing. No cardio, no weights, sleep in, you know, and people have a trouble doing it, but they always look better when you do that. And sometimes it can snap them out of a, a, of a you know, a plateau they've hit where they can't lose any more body fat. For sure, yeah. And, you know, I say it often, but it just kind of brought up a good point. Especially with these top guys, I think my role sometimes with them is just kind of saving them from themselves. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not so much that, like, they really need help. It's more so they just need kind of that yeah. mental companion to, to help lead the way, you know? What do you, um, who do you have uh, on the docket this year? Any, uh, any big names that we don't know about that you started working with? Um, so, I, uh, somebody I'm excited about that I started helping was uh, Michael Toscano. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's good. He, uh, he's really good. Yeah, he I know. took second uh, at the end of the year. So he's actually, we're working his way up. He's, he, his plan is to do the New York Pro in 2021 in the Open. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm excited about him. Uh, I have Nick Walker. He's going to be doing North oh, okay. America this year. Big, big kids. Um, so very very big. excited about that. Uh, and then obviously Sean. I mean, we have a huge opportunity with Sean uh, in the 212 this year. So he's going to be resting all the way up to that show. This is the first time he's ever taken a full year off. Uh, and we're just again like we're prepping every day for that show now. What what do you, you know? think this? What do you think that Sean could ultimately weigh on stage that would look good for his frame, but you know wouldn't blow out you know his his gut or whatever you know but different body parts. I, I think we can get like a, another eight pounds. Wow. Uh, and I'm not saying eight pounds from last year to this year. I'm just mm -hmm. saying like eight pounds total, and I and I think it would look tremendous on him. Mm -hmm. You know, if we got maybe four to five this year, I'd be thrilled. Uh, and then, you know, maybe another three next year and then see where we're at from there. The only thing that we're always going to be fighting an uphill battle with Sean is just his clavicle width. Yeah. Um, that's really, you know, when I was looking at the, the guys this year, I think that's the, the one area that we're just always going to struggle with because, I mean, his bones are only going to be so wide, you sure. know. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, he was uh, fully peeled down, ready to go to the show. He was at 168, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, this year, so I think we can get another about eight pounds on him wow. and, and just see where he's at. He's like another Dexter Jackson, really, except he started even lighter than Dexter. He was so yeah. he was so small when he first turned pro. Good shape and everything like that, but you know, just just no muscle, you know, compared to some of these guys. To think that he's competing, you know, for for the Olympia title at the 212 level is is unbelievable. And I've seen Sean. I know Sean from back in New York, you know, New Jersey, uh, and uh, this guy has just made consistent gains. For the last whatever ten years or eight years, I've known him. You know, it's crazy. Yeah, he's he's a machine. I mean, it's a it's a blessing to be able to help him because he's awesome. Um, all right, are you going? To, I know you don't have anyone in the Arnold, but are you going to be heading out there uh, to Columbus? Yeah, I'm going to go. I got a I got a house with some of my guys, um, Nick and a few other guys. We're just going to get together and train and watch the show. Cool. And I'm excited. I I love you know it's kind of like the kickoff to the year, so I love being out there and just seeing everybody. And I'm I'm excited to to watch the show as a fan this year and not have any responsibilities. You know, so I'm, I'm excited about that. I, I love doing that. I, I, don't, I hate having guys, especially at the top level in the show, because it's too nerve-wracking for me. But yeah, you're right. You don't enjoy it. It's nice going there. I remember back in the day uh, when uh, Jim Lorma owned the, the World Gym, it's, I forget what it's called. I think it's called Metro or something like that now. It's right around the corner from the venue. Everyone used to go there and train on Thursday. And I would see every pro guy back in the day was there, and it was just—it was like almost like uh, if you're a, if you're a guy who's just starting out, it's like the greatest thing you can. It's like going to Golds in Venice, you know, back in yeah. the day. This yeah. is about as close as it's going to get because everyone who's like a top guy who's not competing is usually in that gym training, you know. Right. So, all right. Well, Matt, I'll I'll probably see you out in Columbus, and I want to thank you for coming on. And uh, I know you got a website and an app now. Talk to me a little bit about how people could sign up for that and what, what, what's uh, available for them. 
Yeah, so I have a, an app. It's just called Camp Jansen, and then the website is camp-jansen.com, and it's a membership-based site where I am, uh, you know, just kind of going through my my training philosophies as a coach, um, you know, and nutrition and diet, and then I also have several members of, of the team, the guys that I work with that are um, – loading up their training logs that we're going through kind of a, a series of off season videos with them where they're at in their progress. So that's something you guys can be a part of if you want. Um, also I am a co-owner with revive MD, which is a nutraceutical company. Mm-hmm. Um, so you guys definitely check them out. You guys, please feel free to send me any messages that you have, any questions that you have about camp Jansen or revive. I'd be happy to help. Cool. Um, and again, Dave, thank you. Seriously. Thank you. This has been, uh, this has been special for me. I've I've watched um, everything that you've done since I was 16 years old. So <laughs> That's great. being able to be on here and, and be a part, I, I appreciate it. That's awesome. How old are you now, by the way? I'm 30. Oh, you're young still. You're a baby. Yeah, I'm still young. Yeah. <laughs> are we going to see you compete this year? Uh, m- most likely not this year, just because of the guys that I have in shows. Um, I I really I, I took third last year at USA's, yeah. and I and I kind of I would like to win that show. Um, so my goal is to compete there again next year. Okay. Um, and, and do that show next year. So that's that's kind of where my head's at right now. We just had a baby. I, I have a six month old and then a, a I was two gonna and a say I remember that. Congratulations, by the way. Yeah, Thank yours you. is so a little I'm, older than I'm mine. Enjoying being a dad and, and you know, I love being a dad and, and obviously just trying to, to take care of myself financially and set up businesses and stuff like that. But I, I do want to compete again. Um, so that's kind of the plan for now. That first year of life is very difficult to to, to get enough sleep and for, for competing it's just really not I don't know how people do it, to be honest with you, with young kids. Yeah, I know. I it's, didn't have any tough. kids when I competed. I, I take my hat off to you and, and because I don't, I could never have done it. <laughs> you, God bless your wife. She's got to be amazing. <laughs> she is. She is. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Thanks for joining us on Guru Talk. And guys, if you have any um, suggestions for future topics on the show, if you want to get Matt back, put them in the comments below. For now, though, I'm Dave Palumbo for Matt Jansen. We'll see you next week.